I'm the director of the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian, and um, I, I have I, I've been asked to be the moderator this morning at at, at this session about representing blackness in museology. Um, we've got a, a sort of varied approach this morning, um, and I think we'll end up having time for conversation. Um, we have some formal presentations, some less formal presentations, and then there should be a, a good 15 or 20 minutes for conversation, I think. So um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Deborah Mack. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm with the National Museum of African American History and Culture that is scheduled to be to open in middle 2016 on the Mall. Um, and I came on board less than three years ago, about two and a half years ago, as we began to develop um, without having a collection. We're building everything. We're building the ship as we sail it, actually. Um, but building really strategic partnerships. Uh, the off our division is called technically Community and Constituent Services, and what we do is really linked to the founding legislation, the authorizing legislation for the museum, and it really is, uh, has a central focus of really raising the field, the museum field. African American and African diaspora museum, cultural heritage, preservation, et cetera, organizations and constituent groups. So as opposed to our museum education and public programs, which deal with community in the conventional sense, a little more routinely, although we do that, much of our work is about professional organizations, um, member organizations, constituent organizations. And so our work deals with not only a, a Metro DC area, uh, which is one that we're developing as a focus, but then it's also national. It's uh, emphasizing regional cultures around the U.S. and beyond. And we're developing, we're in the, part, in the process of developing partnerships with some of our partners, the Latino Center, with Folk Life, with the Anacostia Community Museum, with African Art, with International Relations, in developing some research as well as programmatic partnerships nationally and internationally, focus in, on the Caribbean and Latin America, uh, also a major focus on Africa. And these are projects that are all sort of in formation. So we were really delighted to be participating in this because we're here largely to learn from all of you and to tap into the resources that the, Afri that the Black Mosaic exhibit really launched 20 years ago, uh, more than 20 years ago, but as an exhibition and program and research program and community building effort, which has been had a long-term impact and has had a very sustained impact. There's a lot that we hope to learn from and, and, um, uh, and continue in other kinds of dimensions. But equally, we are very interested in the work that all of you do. So this program, for me personally, is just a gold mine already. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you really just uh, some early work that's in progress. We are literally beginning only this year in putting together a strategic plan for our services and also conducting for the first time constituent research on who identifies with a National Museum of African American History and Culture. What does that mean in the 21st century? Um, I served as an advisor to this museum for seven or eight years before I came on staff and one of the questions I always asked was, in the 21st century, who's African American? And what does that mean? Um, in the same way that the Black Mosaic exhibition was dealing with communities in the 1990s, we're dealing with constituents a full generation later, and the identities and identity formation for many young, well, let's, it's very generational, we know, many of us know that, but young people under, okay, I'll say 30, our youngest <laughs> stakeholders under 30, and our youngest stakeholders under 40 identify in very similar and in very different ways. It's uh, very often no longer an either or, it's an and, 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 and I think we, many of us know that. So I'm just going to, uh, in this presentation, talk about some of the shape of the seminal ideas that are shaping what we are doing and also the directions we're going in. If this will work. So we do have uh, programmatic and strategic partnership values that are shaping what we're, going, what we're doing, our, uh, it, including in our mission and vision, creating opportunities for those who care about African-American culture and history to explore and revel in that history. 
um, to stimulate dialogue, to illustrate how the African American freedom struggle has impacted freedom struggles around the world. We, one thing that we already know from our, our prior, our founding audience research is that there's a huge international audience for this. People who are outside the United States who identify and connect with the mission of our, this museum uh, in many ways. We also want to engage new audiences um, in collaboration with a lot of institutions in addition to individuals and communities. Uh, much of this is educational uh, in terms of uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, similarly um, driven organizations, et cetera, around memory, around preservation, about future forecasting. We uh, are very much in anything we do demonstrating the national and global impact of African American history and culture. And of course, this is a, as a Smithsonian institution, um, we're really focused on helping all Americans and non-Americans understand the centrality of African American history to the 21st century. When the museum opened, the very first, uh, our museum opened with no collections. We have been collecting since the beginning um, in the last seven years. We're now at about 37,000 objects, manuscripts, images, et cetera. But this object was the very first donation um, archived, um, or rather accessioned object into the collection. And it is a, a stool from a dugout, commune, uh, dugout canoe. And it was donated by Juan Garcia Salazar, who's a very noted activist, scholar uh, from Ecuador. I think many of you are familiar with his work. And this came from his family's collections, from his mother and grandmother. And it's one of the examples that will be illustrated as one of our core exhibitions of the first thing that people see that's, in a sense, diasporic. And that the spider symbol that's on the top of the school, this stool, and that is by the family and by, the, by his grandmother. And we, are, we, are, we have actual oral histories on this, and we're con continu continuing additional interviews with her daughter, his mother, and with him. They talk about Anansi, Anansi the spider. This is a widely, a, a, of course, a very broadly interpreted symbol. But in the Esmeraldas region of Ecuador, it has power. It had power then, has power now, and resonates as a one singular example of this kind of connection, connectedness over time and place. We also are learning from comparable and related projects, similar but also different. There's a multi-museum project uh, community-based project called Latino New South, and it involves three museums, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, the Levine Museum of the New South, which is in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and the Atlanta History Center. Each of them were dealing with topics which were historically seen as African-American centered around civil rights as well as other issues, and each of them are in uh, locations in urban areas that have experienced extreme hypergrowth in Hisp Hispanic or Latino um, immigration. And uh, this has been, th these are organizations that thought they knew who they were talking to. They knew that their audiences understood the background of these historical um, stories that they were trying to share and the values and the issues. And they have very large new communities that come from a variety of different places. And so in investigating what that meant, they have, in, in the way that the Anacostia Community Museum has taken on a new mission to address its, the current reality around it, these museums are doing this as well. Um, and this was a, a multi-year project that really wanted to explore the ways that the emerging history of these new populations could relate to what they were doing. New opportunities, new challenges, new realities. There were two major parts to this the listening sessions that were in these three cities with various community constituents, and the scholarly session, a, a first scholarly session, and there have been more since then, very comparable to what we're doing here, this mixture of both elements, that really brought demographic, geographical, community-based, uh, value-based, cultural-based information to the table. And there were what they called six or seven major insights that, that have shaped now how each of them is going to proceed. And I'm going to just run through them very briefly because this will actually be somewhat comparable to the kinds of work we're going to do. Number one, you can use the word immigrant or migrant, but Latinos in general are here to stay. They are 
the United States as well, whether people recognize that or not, depending on the location. And of course, as we know, even in the Washington, D.C. area, and this will be a research focus for us, it's the, the Latino, Hispanic populations from Central and South America are the single fastest growing um, group in terms of school systems. The diversity of cultures, as most of us are aware, um, the majority of the United States finds that kind of cultural complexity complex, just beyond there. It's like, you know, but aren't they all the same? The biculturalism, because of generations, especially generational growth and change, is growing. As most of us know from any place in the world, the young people are the first ones to adapt in multiple ways very comfortably. Extended families are important throughout most of these cultures, most of these background communities. That is an important factor when you think of some of our, I'll just say historically, you know, I won't say, I won't pick on art museums, of course. <laughs> but you know, mom, dad, and two children just doesn't resonate with the, with the realities of 21st century. Bridging is essential. You, one cannot say, well, you know, what do you mean you don't know the Martin Luther King story, or you don't know the 19th century history of the Civil War, you don't know so and so. One has to connect the various realities and various experiences. Um, in the museum field, we often say you meet your visitor, you meet your visitors where they are, and you take them to the next level. Bridging is one of those mechanisms. And language is a powerful symbol and a powerful sign of respect or disrespect and becoming documented for many immigrants, this, whether it's Latino or anywhere else in the world, and this can be often a multi-generational issue, is often impossible in the United States at present. Those seven insights have shaped much of what is going on in many African American museums in terms of their staffing, their storylines, their exhibitions and programs. And this Latino New South project has been uh, really illustrative and a model for many museums that are working on these issues. It's also informing, uh, and uh, my last three issues really are just talking about the research which we are only beginning now in our museum that will inform future planning and programming for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, not only for, um, for a wide variety of constituents. We're already engaged in African, Caribbean, Latin American research partnerships and programmatic partnerships. Um, but in trying to understand, because our museum mission talks about African American and Africa diaspora audiences and constituents, I have maintained that we have no data, no information, and to this point have not what I consider made an honest investment in approaching communities and asking them. That's a process that we are designing and shaping and beginning only now. Audience research is needed because very little is known about the perceptions of various d diverse black audiences. If you are a Nigerian cultural organization in Washington, D.C., we don't know who you are. We don't know what your priorities are. We don't know who your membership is. We don't know what your interests are. We don't know if you relate to this museum or if you don't, and if you do, in what ways. And so this audience research, this qualitative research, really right now for this first stage profiling, the metro DC area, which is a highly global area, is totally necessary. Um, this will, of course, shape our post-opening exhibits, programs, and continued research collaborations. And uh, the key issues that we are including, uh, I, highlighting for this first phase of research, which will be about a year, um, who are these audiences? And we're de dealing with issues of language, affiliation, et cetera. Um, how are these communities likely to see themselves? Do they, as I said before, do they relate? Do they not? If not, why not? In what, is it gendered? Is it generational? Is it economic? Is it class? What types of exhibit topics and programs and media platforms can we best engage visitors on? I, we maintain that we cannot just assume that we know what that is. And what types of organizations ultimately can we approach or who t should we you know, work with um, for ongoing collaboration? So again, I just wanted to conclude that for me, this 
program is a fabulous resource because we are a brand new Smithsonian unit that will learn a lot from this program and from all of you. And thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, now I'd like to introduce Diana Baird and Jai from the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. Thank you, Michael. Uh, first of all, um, at the there are at least three reasons, at least three reasons why uh, revisiting the Black Mosaic Project um, is of great professional and personal uh, significance to me. Uh, first of all, at the request of curator extraordinaire um, Portia James, uh, the Anacostia stalwart deputy director, <laughs> Sharon Rankin, um, and director Steve Newson at the time, um, I had the pleasure of organizing the training curriculum for the Black Mosaic Project as a community research project. And um, when we're talking about representation, actually I'm gonna go over to my slides. I just realized that I started there. We're gonna switch places. But um, I realized that um, the training of community researchers was so important in um, not only provi providing access to voice, but also to the tools of voice. And um, I'd been, at, at the time, I'd been a Smithsonian curator for only about four years, and I just finished implementing a training curriculum for a project at Folklife to work with community scholars uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. B Betty Belenis, um, on Afri on African who had who were born in Africa and who had migrated to the Washington D.C. area, thank you, from various countries on the African continent. Uh, so that is one reason. The second reason was as the daughter of immigrants, married to an immigrant, um, the stories that were told so eloquently in the Black Mosaic Project are resonant with the stories of my two families. Uh, my sister, Marsha Veard Burris, who I think is in the back there, and who's a, um, proud to say is an Anacostia staff member. Um, and I can both attest to the ways that our identities as immigrants and as African Americans shaped uh, who we are, shaped our experience, and perhaps even the choices that we made to work in cultural institutions. Um, we, um, I know I remember that um, going to school and, and folks were talking about foods and, and um, they were talking about you know, uh, southern foods and, and so on. And, and I remember saying, oh, well, am I black because I eat uh, pepper pot and curry and roti? And, and I wasn't too sure what, actually, I wasn't too sure what chitlins were and, and, <laughs> and grits and stuff because that wasn't part of what <laughs> we ate at home. But so I, I guess all of those, um, I think, resonated in some of the narratives that, that were there um, in the Black Mosaic Project. And third, uh, this forum gives me, gives me, gives us an opportunity to reflect on the past, present, and project our inquiry into the future concerning the research representation and self-representation of African diaspora people. Um, and although I can't hope to cover the length and breadth of African diaspora projects at the Smithsonian, I thought I'd like to do a very quick and brief overview of some of the projects um, across this, well, at the Smithsonian, mostly <laughs> actually at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, um, but um, these that help to set some of the conceptual and methodological benchmarks for this work in the space of, I guess, the nine minutes that, that um, that go along, and, and one of the things that, that's really important is that I think that um, the center um, has, al has always seen ourselves as partners with the Anacostia, and we've partnered on a lot of things, but we've also seen ourselves as joined at the hip and being in the vanguard, even when people were saying, what? Community people cannot, you know, objectively look at their own culture. What's that, you know? And uh, so it's been a struggle, and I, I see Portia nodding there. It's been a struggle to uh, look at the, in, in terms of the museology community, until recently when participatory museology is now finally uh, coming into the consciousness um, of 
the museum community is large. So um, the uh, Roy, first of all, um, I have to say a note that Roy Bryce Laporte, um, in his seminal work on the new immigration, uh, published right here uh, at the Wilson Center, um, talked about the invisibility of immigrants of color, and uh, in his source book on the new immigration, um, which he wrote around 10 years after 1965, uh, which loosened the immigration laws, which, which allowed for the influx of Caribbean immigrants and so on. Um, he talked about the importance of mapping the social and cultural dimensions of the and the arrival of immigrants of, col of color. And I know that he was also a very important part of the, uh, the Black Mosaic Project. So, um, but in, 19, um, in the 1970s, the Folklife, the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, which was then the Office of Folklife Programs, uh, took advantage of the funds leading up to the nation's bicentennial to um, form the African Diaspora Advisory Group, uh, ADAG. And this group uh, included research luminaries such as uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan, uh, Leonard Goins, Joseph Harrow, Harris, who did pioneering work in conceptualizing the African diaspora, and Dr. Bryce Laporte, working on the arrival of new immigrants. The research team was also, um, here you go, here you go. Uh, and the research team was also largely African diaspora students. Uh, my mentor, Gerald Davis, who first headed the project, Bernice Johnson Reagan, uh, James Early, John Franklin, uh, Beverly Robinson were all involved as cultural researchers. Now. Uh, although the term diaspora comes from the Greek word scattering, implying the dispersal of Jews around the world, how it was used um, in, uh, more recently, ADAG organized research for the festival celebrating the bicentennial of the United States around the concept of reuniting diaspora and bringing culture keepers, people of African descent who, doc as Dr. Bernice uh, Johnson Reagan said, survived um, slavery in the Americas, Together with artists from the continent of Ghana, uh, from the continent of Africa, from Ghana, Senegal, Li Nigeria, Liberia, as well as from the Caribbean and South America, and the festival was, was for most of the summer long. I cannot believe that, and represent, represented the concept of diaspora as reunion, as family reunion, and I think that this has been a very important theme both for the Anacostia and for um, the um, the Center for Folklife and cultural heritage, as well as for the newer, some of the newer projects that um, have been done. The program in African American culture, by the way, at the Museum of African, of American History, uh, took this up, um, and Niani Kilkenny, um, who was there for quite a while, developed programs every February that dealt with different aspects of um, diaspora and the role of, um, African Americans in American history, and of course uh, Faith Ruffin, who is who is here, is, um, has spearheaded the um, the immigration and migration. Hi, <laughs> the immigration and migration uh, project. So I, I think that that what is so wonderful is that there have been part these partnerships that have really enhanced uh, and have really developed out of and, and cross fertilized um, this work. Uh, very quickly, uh, the programs on African um, uh, diaspora culture at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which recently have been uh, partnered and co-sponsored with the African American Museum of History and Culture, uh, have again focused on the idea of diaspora and um, the the various aspect, the, the, both the diversity and the continuities of experience within uh, of people of African descent, both immigrants and, and um, folks who have, um, who are descendants of, of people who came over in earlier migrations. So um, these cultures were expressed in different ways, through music, through dance, through narrative, through uh, the experience of 
um, storytelling uh, throughout the, the experiences at the Folklife Festival and uh, the exhibitions that, that came out of the Folklife Festival, uh, the, the exhibitions that came out of the Black Mosaic Program, I think also um, had these aspects of, of looking at how people identified themselves and shaped community through the objects that were brought over, but also the experiences. Uh, in at the same time that the Black Mosaic program was going on, uh, there was a program that uh, we were organizing at Folklife called the African Immigrant Project. And at that time, um, the the entry of people from the second diaspora from the continent was very was relatively new. I it can't believe it's 20 years since it's happened. But you know, we were interested in how there were um, the, the interplay between people who were from older diasporas and the newer diasporas of Africans from the continent. And um, I think that, again, um, in, in looking at these new diasporas of African immigrants, we saw some of the same, um, we, we saw resonance between old and new. We saw uh, in, in a very long term, uh, history, uh, ways that people were integrating into this community. And, and when we talk about, I, I've, talked, I've talked about African um, black mosaic turning, it, turning into African American kaleidoscope. And I think there um, we have to talk about how in the present day uh, we recognize that rather than being a community uh, or a set of communities that is coming over here and establishing themselves as separate, isolated immigrant communities, that there's so much interplay and there's so much change uh, within the communities of African descent, even now. And we're also looking at uh, not only the reunion, but how um, folks from uh, the the uh, Japanese communities um, on the West Coast, for example, are um, adopting in drumming traditions um, drumming patterns from, from Nigeria, how foods are becoming um, uh, creolized in this country and in this community um, between um, Africa, Asia, and um, traditional um, African-American foods, how clothing, which is uh, something that we're looking at, um, is uh, really a mixture of all of these things. And within all of this, the voices of people and the kinds of skills that we can help, our co that we can facilitate as uh, museum people in building among uh, con communities to record their own histories, our own histories, to uh, take these skills back into communities, to create community museums, uh, to create exhibitions in churches and schools, and to uh, train young people in the skills of critical, in the critical thinking skills involved in recording uh, narratives and so on are really part of this new museology which the Black uh, Mosaic uh, Project was really a pioneer in. So um, as I said, we have been joined at the hip and, I'm, and I am looking forward to seeing these new iterations of the Black Mosaic Project and also to the partnerships that grow with um, the Anacostia Museum as a community museum, with the Museum of African American History and Culture, um, with Folklife and uh, with American History and with, with this new form of participant museology that's not only about bringing people into the museum, but giving people the skills to 
uh, make museuming uh, a verb, as, as uh, Dr. Richard Curran has talked about, and to, to look at it, uh, to take it beyond the walls of the museum. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Diana. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Carmen Ramos, who's a curator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, and I've been here, been at the Smithsonian American Art Museum for just four years, which seems a very short period of time, given that I've met people who've been here their, their whole careers. <laughs> Um, and I was, I am the, the first named curator for Latino art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and in part of a larger cadre of Latino curators that are, have recently come on board um, at the Smithsonian and are embedded at different institutions that are really kind of focusing on uh, Latino art and culture and really integrating that uh, throughout, throughout the institution. Um, I'm very uh, thankful to Ariana Curtis, who's a wonderful colleague, for inviting me to present uh, at this forum that uh, reflects upon the important work of the Anacostia Museum, uh, which 20 years ago organized the Black Mosaic, an exhibition that tackled diverse blackness in the nation's capital. The questions posed by the Black Mosaic about the impact of migration on national and transnational belonging, race and personal and group identity, um, um, to name but a few, remain salient issues, especially for Smithsonian museums, many of which are dedicated to collecting, exhibiting, and ultimately interpreting our national unfolding, a process to which immigration has been a central propelling force. In the mid-1990s, the Anacostia approached these questions by capturing the testimonies of migrants themselves, displaying their material culture, and offering historical accounts of the ways in which black migrants, including <coughs> many Afro-Latinos, established communities and networks in Washington, D.C. As a museum curator, I've asked myself, how do we keep these important discussions moving forward without replicating the past? For as the Anacostia was organizing and presenting the Black Mosaic, art museums and centers around the country were simultaneously tackling similar questions of migration, group identity, and race in American society from various Latino and other perspectives. Uh, this flurry of exhibitions referenced in this slide, uh, which we now closely associate with the multicultural era, sought to tackle head on the formation of Latino racialized identities and the ways in which contemporary artists explored inequities in, in American history and society. How do art museums frame questions of blackness and diaspora? Do we have a special role to play for while we too are concerned with history, identity, and citizenship, our focus on works of art surely offer a different angle that is more speculative, open to interpretation, or pardon the pun, less black and white. My own approach to these issues in organizing the exhibition, Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art, that was recently presented at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, might best be called subtle, yet I believe effective at placing issues of race, representation, and African diasporic, and, and the African diaspora at the crux of Latino art and culture. The exhibition did not rightly set out to specifically explore diverse blackness, but rather sought to illuminate the ways in which Latino artists working since the mid 20th century, most of whom were not part of the standard histories of American art, recalibrated national themes and participated in the country's artistic movements. By looking at recurring themes of American national identity and expression, from notions of expansionism, migration, popular culture, and mid 20th century abstraction. Uh, and looking at these issues through the work of Latino artists, Our America put forth ideas about how fundamental concerns of American experience and expression are unsettled and multi perspectival. In using the term Latino, the exhibition embraced an aggregate and strategic construct that refers to US-based communities with diasporic ties to various Latin American nations, as well as those of incorporated populations such as Puerto Ricans and Mexicans in the Southwest around 1848. Even as people of African descent are very much part of the construct Latino, 
our America did not section off works that explored issues of race, representation, and African diasporic culture, but instead wove these concerns throughout the fabric of the exhibition, repeatedly exposing viewers to these issues from a number of angles. Our audience, for example, encountered the abstract works of Freddy Rodriguez, whose tall and slender canvases that feature bright and zigzagging lines meant to evoke the energy of Latino musical expressions in New York, such as merengue and salsa, which the artist saw as rooted in African musical traditions, a fact conveyed by his chosen titles, Carnival Dance, African Love, and African Dance. Viewers saw Sophie Rivera's large-scale and direct photographs of Puerto Ricans who traversed New York City. In seeking to combat stereotypes in American popular culture, Rivera documented and monumentalized everyday Puerto Ricans. In doing so, she did not privilege a single type, but created a wide-ranging survey that encompassed Puerto Ricans of all stripes, black, white, male, female, young, and old. Our America featured artists like Marcos Dimas, who belongs to a pioneering generation of New York-based Puerto Rican artists who actively reordered traditional racial hierarchies of Puerto Rican uh, identity to articulate a hybrid African and Native American or Afro-Taino identity that also challenged Puerto Rican marginalization in the United States. Dimas' pariah, which presents a monumental and racially hybrid figure who stares back at the viewer with dignity and defiance, boldly embodies these ideas. Other works offered poetic attempts to grapple with tough issues, such as the Middle Passage. Maria Magdalena Campospon's Constellation, which consists of a grid of large-scale Polaroids that capture the artist's braided and dreadlocked hair, created a constellation-like image that evokes the idea of the African diaspora as dispersed yet culturally, uh, yet a culturally connected entity. And I could cite many more examples from the exhibition, but in the interest of time, I'll stop here. By referencing black, blackness throughout the exhibition, our America conveyed the centrality of race to notions of Latino identity. In this way, our America set forth on a different path than the increasing tendency to frame issues of blackness in Latino culture under the, under the moniker Afro-Latino. While I understand the need to employ Afro-Latino as a way to raise issues of self-representation, to create visibility for Latinos who fall into a number of cultural and racial categories, and as an effort to combat the racial, hier ri racial hierarchies uh, still present in Latino culture, the term can also suggest that Latinos and Afro-Latinos are somehow two separate groups. For me, notions of blackness are already deeply rooted in some of the earliest articulations of Latino identity in the, United in the United States by groups such as the Young Lords, who professed in their 13 point program that, quote, Puerto Ricans are of all colors, end quote. I believe that you can't have a conversation about Latino culture and history without invoking notions of race and blackness. And it is this fluid way of seeing Latino identity that our America sought to convey. Nonetheless, I'm very much aware that to organize an exhibition of artists from sort of a single group, <laughs> um, as we did in our America, has its limitations. As we look toward the future, what is increasingly evident is that we need exhibitions and forums where the intersections across diverse blackness can be more closely explored. A natural place to start are the common concerns among Latino, Caribbean, and African-American artists. What I'm proposing is less of the kind of artists of color exhibition that prevailed in the late 1980s and early 90s, but an effort that considers very specific questions grounded in artworks themselves or artistic processes. Along these lines, Rocio Arando Alvarado and I have just proposed a panel for the 2016 College Art Association annual meeting to be held in Washington, D.C. in February 2016. Titled after a County Cullen poem, What is Africa to Me? U.S. Space Artists and African Diasporic Traditions Since the 1960s, the panel seeks to bring together scholars investigating U.S.-based artists that ushered a shift away from a generalized quoting of African uh, diasporic art and culture, which prevailed in the modernist era, 
toward a praxis that was informed by the study and specificity of African diasporic tradition. As Rocio and I currently understand it, this dynamic shift was informed by many factors, the quest for civil rights, the rise of black power and other radical groups of the post-civil rights era, solidarity with anti-colonial movements, Caribbean migration, and burgeoning new scholarship on African and diasporic art. For many artists who fall into this category, their intimate knowledge of the diaspora derived from family history or direct connections to African, Latin American, and Caribbean nations played an important role in engaging diasporic tradition. It is clear that African American Latino artists figure prominently in the shift, yet their works are not often juxtaposed or placed into direct dialogue. In fact, explorations of African diasporic practices and contemporary art, such as Arturo Lunzi's important book, Santeria Aesthetics, seem to, take, uh, seem to take place in different circles, focused either on African American or Latino and Latin American art. Yet, the evidence suggests otherwise. Art historian Tob uh, Tobias Wolfert has argued that African American artists such as Houston Conwell were directly impacted by Robert Ferris Thompson's scholarship on the African diaspora, much of it based on Thomas's, uh, Thompson's investigations in Latin America. Even as Conwell grounded his early work, such as passages in diasporic retentions found in Southern US culture, thanks to Robert Ferris Thompson, his artistic practice was later transformed by his increasing knowledge of traditions in Cuba, Brazil, and Haiti. It is these intersections where the African-American, Caribbean, Latino, and or Latin American overlap that I find worthy of further study. It points to the special role that Latino and Latin American cultural formations have played in the larger consideration of African tradition in contemporary art. In a similar vein, we hope that proposed papers might consider the work of someone like Dominican-American artist Chara Orquette, living and working in Miami and influenced by her close contact with other Caribbean communities, both Cuban and Haitian. Orquette performs and creates massive assemblages made of wood, toys, and cheap ephemera meant to evoke specific deities from Voodoo and Santeria. One might argue that her embeddedness in a pan-Caribbean community created a safe space for her to freely explore issues of African diaspora tradition outside of the racial taboos of Dominican island-based society. Ultimately, we hope not only to begin to map out the history of a shift, in African a shift to African diasporic specificity, but to explore how the movement of artists and ideas were also a central element in the process itself. And these are just some ideas that I hope that we could explore in our conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. Um, so I was originally thinking that I would just moderate, but my colleagues have suggested that I should say a few things. Um, like Ariana, I am at the Smithsonian because of the Black Mosaic Project. Um, I came here uh, to work at the Anacostia Museum in 1992. Uh, for Portia James. Um, and it, the origins of the show, uh, as Ariana said earlier, had everything to do with a particular moment in time and a particular moment in this city and, and the spaces around this city. Um, and the, the, she eloquently put it, the ethnic and racial tensions were very high at the time and uh, it was, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, I had been working in uh, the Afro-Cuban community here for a number of years before I came, and, and when the riots happened, uh, and phones weren't working, and people were really scared. Uh, so th these are very real experiences that many of us still live with. Um, I, I actually live in Mount Pleasant still, so it's, it's uh, something I think about with some regularity. The, the, re the relevance of, of the project, I think, um, at the time and and still now uh, can't be understated, I don't think, uh, uh, or rather can't be overstated. Th there was a deep desire by those of us working at Anacostia, and, and that included uh, people working on this wonderful advisory board. They included Faith and, and Diana, but, but there was a really deep commitment to making the Smithsonian a more inclusive place. 
and to bring stories that had been excluded into the conversation and, and provide that platform, which is, as Diana said, is, is very much um, been the ethos of the center for a very long time as well. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I, it's quite clear to me now that uh, we at Anacostia were borrowing the, the community scholar model that had been being developed by Folklife and, and by other places as well, but, but really developed extensively by Folklife. And um, that work is fascinating because what it requires is the formulation of a, a shared formulation of the questions. Um, the, the scholarly community comes with a set of questions and, and puts those out with the community in the community conversation and the change and, and the conversation changes the questions that are being asked by the research. And that's I think really important to underscore. Um, in, in the end, the questions that we were answering with this documentation and with this exhibition were driven in part by our curiosity and our concerns, but, but extensively by, by a deep and ongoing conversation um, to the point that in most cases, we were not actually doing the interviews or taking the pictures. We were having community scholars do that work and relying on them, their knowledge of the history of their communities, their knowledge of where to find knowledgeable, uh, sort of remarkable tradition bearers and, and artists and, and spokespeople in their communities. Um, so the, the 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 gathering in uh, of material itself was also deeply driven by community engagement. Um, Ariana alluded to obstacles, and I would say that there were many. Um, I, I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but it it seems to me that we um, we were doing the best that we could, and we had good people. Uh, coaching us and, and helping us, and we didn't really actually know, none of us had ever done this before. <laughs> so it was really quite quite remarkable, and as I reflect on it, um, th there was an amazing amount of bravery on Porsche's part, I think, on Sharon Rankin's part, uh, who, who was really a, a driving organizational force that made it possible for us to do our work, um, and, and also on Steve Newsom's part for, for making this happen w without a strong a strong base of experience. Um, it, I will never forget just thinking about the internal resistance, um, a meeting where someone literally said, why are we doing an exhibition about those people? Mm. So it gives you a sense of how, how much division actually existed within the institution, which was not large. Uh, there were probably 25 of us maybe at that point. Um, so those obstacles were quite real. Um, the, the building of this collection, though, I think is quite remarkable because the collection, the collecting exists, of course, and the exhibition raises questions about representation and the politics of representation. The programming that grew out of it and continues to grow out of it is, a, is another piece. Um, but collections, uh, as Portia said, are really most valuable in, in the ways in which they continue to live. And that life, I think, has a number of uh, trajectories. It, th there are questions that we can ask now about what was happening here 20 and 25 years ago because that collection exists that we would not otherwise have good documentation of. Uh, so so there, there's one vector that's about asking new questions about the past and, and really using that data uh, to explore those questions. And, and then the other trajectory is uh, about using the collections to engage new audiences. Um, that, that work is uh, never ending really, but I think th the creation of the collection makes a whole number of things possible that wouldn't have been otherwise. Uh, as I was thinking about today, I, I found myself thinking over and over again about the meaning of the black mosaic after 20 years. Um, and of course its meaning is uh, open-ended and, and uh, Ariana is bringing all kinds of new meaning to it today and, and you're all helping. Um, I, I, People have already alluded to the deep relevance of these questions over time. Uh, you know, the Smithsonian is still got the still wrestling with immigration and migration and and what that make how to make sense of that and how to represent that in the national unfolding and 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 that's across many parts of the Smithsonian, uh, and and that's of course a larger narrative uh, that's happening around the country. Um, it's interesting to me that the issues that I remember most clearly being identified in 
the interviews that we were doing remain incredibly relevant today. Um, the relationship to the state and state power particularly. Um, obviously, the, the fact that there had just been riots and there was in incredible tension with the police um, was very real. Um, but the issues around uh, documentation for immigrants was and is a real issue in, in many communities. Um, because of my own work, I'm particularly aware of the almost um, unbridled power of the uh, Humane Society um, law enforcement officers who can stop anything that is going on with any animal in the city pretty much at a moment's notice. So anybody who has a tradition, uh, a food tradition or a religious tradition that in involves live animals is constantly running up against that. Um, so relationship to the state is a big theme, I think. Artists' rights is another big theme that we heard over and over again. The, the desire that people had to find venues for performance that would validate their traditions in some way, but, but also the really basic issues of how to sustain an art form and make a living at the same time. Um, another one that we hear about all the time today. Uh, the issue of access, of course, uh, to, to cultural institutions like the Smithsonian, uh, having access to a platform to share stories and, and, and articulate concerns. And obviously that links to a larger political set of political issues uh, and, and access to the political process. But, but I think it's safe to say that we are all still wrestling with that uh, in, in the cultural sector and certainly at the Smithsonian. Um, and then these, these rich um, questions about cultural continuity and cultural change. Uh, the, the animating questions, I think, continue to animate many of us in our work. Um, how do individuals live their diversity? How does that diversity challenge and enrich the life of communities? And, and what role can we as cultural activists and museum professionals uh, play in bridging communities and, and supporting the development of communities? Um, in the end, that richness of story, I think that, that uh, Portia mentioned in her opening remarks, remains for me one of the hallmarks of the, of the, prog of the, the project um, as well. It, the, the, the sharing of the experiences, the, the deep validation of being able to tell your story in a public way, and, and then the emerging uh, conversation about exploring similarities and difference differences is, is really, uh, I, I think, the heart of the project. And um, I, I feel very honored to have been a part of it, as you can probably tell. Um, and I am proud of the work that we continue to do. There's much more to do, to be sure. But um, I, I think uh, it was good that we got started when we did. So um, I, I, I hear in the work uh, of the new museum a, 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 a real sense of the the challenges of staying connected to that very quickly evolving public. And, and that's certainly something that, that the project was wrestling with at the time. Um, and then this, this larger question of um, how to explore these questions uh, and, and represent them to the public in, in different formats, in different genres of presentation, exhibitions, programming, books, conversations, charlas, tertulias, lo que sea. I mean, that, that space is, and, and trying all of those different spaces, which are different for different topics, they're more appropriate for different, certain ones are more appropriate for different topics than others. Um, and then this, the, 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 the leadership of asking specific questions, uh, you're, you're moving the, the conversation forward and speaking about your future, I think is really rich in, mm -hmm. in today's conversation, and I, I applaud that. Um, so uh, are there questions? Well, first, let me say that it's so impressive to hear. Excuse me, there's a microphone. Oh, okay. And it's being brought to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, it's so impressive to hear about what you've accomplished in the past, what you're planning for the future, what you project for the future. And as you were all talking, I had two questions that kept coming to my mind. And the first is the diversity that you all champion 
Is it reflected throughout the Smithsonian in the hiring? There are many, many, many jobs at the Smithsonian, all the member institutions, and uh, Dr. Ramos mentioned that some of her colleagues have been in their positions through their whole careers, so they must be pretty good positions and perhaps well-paying. So I wonder about the diversity throughout the hiring within the Smithsonian. And my second question is about the diversity in who is able to benefit from all these wonderful programs. Who attends the various museums throughout the Smithsonian? Is there diversity there? Is the diversity you champion reflected in who gets hired and who attends and takes advantage of all these wonderful programs? Thank you so much. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I feel particularly fortunate to um, have the honor of managing the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, which is perhaps the the most diverse organization at the Smithsonian. Um, and uh, that is not by my doing, but I will do everything I can to sustain that. I, I inherited an organization that was already very diverse, and it's quite remarkable uh, to, to work in that space every day. Uh, that said, the Smithsonian as a whole, I think, is, um, I, d I don't know the statistics, I'm, I'm not an HR person, but I, I think we all share a sense that uh, we could do a lot better. And I think all of the reports, including willful neglect, have made that very clear. Um, I think there has been a very uh, strong attempt to make interventions uh, like the intervention um, from, from Eduardo Diaz and the Latino Center to bring this new cohort of Latino scholars into leadership positions uh, at the Smithsonian, and I, I think the, the the new museum is certainly an attempt to, to make sure that the, the Smithsonian remains a, a diverse place. Um. Yes, uh, if I and and um, there are dimensions to diversity that go beyond ethnicity. One of um, one of my charges, one of our charges, is that we are bringing on, we are raising in the next two generations of museum professionals, and this goes far beyond, for instance, what the public thinks of in terms of curators, because museums are really non-taxed businesses and organizations. Um, so we have incredibly gifted and powerful and experienced financial managers and finance people and administrators um, who make the Smithsonian the dynamic that it is. On a content side, which is where many people think of the Smithsonian, although the Wa Washington DC is a site of visitation, most of our work is outside in our communities around the nation and around the world. And so the ac issues of accessibility um, in raising, when I talk about raising the field, raising the museum field, which is specifically what I, um, our legis the legislation for our museum talks about HBCUs, tribal museums, I'm sorry, tribal colleges, um, uh, community-based organizations, community memory, um, preservation of not only objects and um, sites and buildings, but in a sense cultural landscapes and memory of, in various forms. There are all of these dimensions in what we're working, so much of what we do, while there are, there, there's work that happens on site and of course the various platforms, digital and media and otherwise, that can go out there, we are out there as well um, in place within these communities, nas regionally, nationally, internationally. Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, there are oases of <laughs> of uh, diversity within the Smithsonian, and then there are deserts, and uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think that um, you know within obviously the Anacostia Museum, um, the Museum of um, African American History and Culture, Latino Center, Asian uh, Center, um, I think that. You know there is an effort, and, and and I and I applaud the the initiatives at the Latino Center to make sure that there are people throughout the Smithsonian who reflect uh, not only different ethnicities, you know, the biological ethnicity, but also we're talking about the perspectives that diversity brings. But I think that there is a very very long way to go, not only in terms of um, who's who is where, you know, like in the sciences and, and 
let's face it, the sciences also have cultural cultural components, but also in um, you know the internships. We there is a minority, and I put that in big quotes. Minority because I don't like that name; it's not accurate. But um, internship program, but. Um, there are real restrictions on who's able to come to the Smithsonian um, and spend a time and get that training to then uh, go on to be, become a curator or a scientist and so on um, here. And I, I think that there's a lot that needs to be done there as well. So, But that's a great question. Thank you. enormous progress, but the bulk of the Smithsonian is a scientific institution. Right. Right. The sciences get more money, they have more staff, and when you look at the science institutions, that's a very different story than what has happened in the cultural areas over the last 25 years. I, I should say that I'd, I'd just like to add that there, there are e efforts uh, like the Youth Access Grants, which are designed to bring young people, uh, diverse young people into the Smithsonian at an early age and, and give them very deep and meaningful experiences. And, and many of our scientific colleagues are using those programs to, to enrich that part of the program and make sure that there is a diverse, yeah. a more diverse future uh, f for the scientific teams. And um, the natural history where I used to work actually also has a, its own fellowship program, which they use quite strategically in this way. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage has as one of its goals, uh, uh, as part of our capital campaign, a million dollar fund that would do just that, so that we could make sure that the most deserving people, regardless of their economic situation, could come and mm -hmm. participate in the training that we provide. I, th I think I'd also like to concur that I think the Smithsonian has a, a ways to go in terms of diversifying its staff. And as someone who's relatively new to the Smithsonian, it was pretty much shocking to me when I arrived. I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, where are the black people? <laughs> I literally asked myself this question. I'm like, where are they? I, I don't see them. Um, so it, it, yeah, it, it's quite shocking. Uh, I, I think that on the level of... Uh, our audience, you know, and who, you know, attends our programs. I think we also have <coughs> a, a, a way to go. You know, I wish we had a Deborah Mack uh, at the Smithsonian American <laughs> Art Museum that was exclusively focused on Latino constituencies, you know, uh, because I think that, you know, a curator can't do it all. That's not, it's not my necessary, my job to really build audiences in that way, you know. I'm interacting with artists. I'm focusing on exhibitions, scholarship, and all of that. I, you can't add on top of that, you know, developing our audience. I, I, that's too much. We need other types of professionals at, throughout the institution that are really focused on, uh, on doing that. I, I just wanted to address the second part of the question also that you talked about, the diversity of the folks who show up for the program. Because I know at my museum, for example, we're very interested in raising the visit, visitor count, I guess in all the museums, you know, that's very important to us. But when we do raise the visitor count, if we are successful, they're still primarily going to be ethnicity aside, they're going to be college educated, they're going to be uh, pretty much middle class, upper working class, uh, you know, folks. Uh, folks who, who um, have a tradition of going to, a, to the museum. And I've been in some other, you know, folks at my museum are really pushing the museum <coughs> to think about the folks who are not included in that, the working mm -hmm. class folks who don't have a tradition of going to, to museums. And, um, I, you know, we, we're in a residential neighborhood, as you well know, where people will walk past us to get to the rec center. Well, that's, there's something wrong with that, and this is our future. I mean, this is the real future of the Museum of the 21st Century, and I, I, it, I think it's it, it also adolescent <laughs> uh, youth, you know, getting them to w not come on the school bus, <laughs> but to come on their own. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the real challenges facing us as an institution. I think Folk Life and Deborah, her organization, will be real pioneers in, in pushing museums to think about how they can capture those audiences as well. Um, I think I've, I've been at the institution almost 30 years. It's come a long way in terms of African Americans. In terms of high-level management, 
We have a long way to go for any minority, and that includes Asian American Pacific heritage. We have a long way to go. Um, if you look at um, some of the the areas of expertise, I'm a special events manager. I am one of two out of all of the museums, minorities in the whole group of special events managers in the institution. So I feel like we have an awful long way to go. In terms of people coming in the doors, the demographics at the Anacostia Community Museum, surprisingly, we have a very mixed group of people coming through the doors, particularly for our history programs and our family programs. We have people traveling from Richmond to come down for some of our family activities. And the diversity always just knocks my socks off. I'm always very grateful in the areas that we've come at the museum in terms of bringing in uh, all groups of people and being inclusive in the programming that we do. So I just wanted to mention that. When we talk about diversifying audiences, we need to keep in mind, you know, the new trend is to do everything online or to reach out online, and the digital divide is real. Um, we need to remember that a lot of minority communities, they're still, their primary source of information is radio. They listen to the radio in their cars, they, you know, even more so than television or the internet. So one of the things that we try to do, in addition to having a, a, an internet pro, um, a portal for access, uh, when it comes to our community activities, we still have to do it the old-fashioned way, paper the community with flyers and s uh, word of mouth and call people because uh, you know digital access to the work that we do is important on a certain level for scholars and, and community researchers and students. But on the day-to-day -day grassroots, people who have to balance survival with entertainment, uh, you know, um, it's still uh, a face-to-face, one-to-one, talk-to-me kind of situation. That'll help with bridging the, the gap, too. Um, I manage the Intern and Fellows Program <coughs> in American History. And I'm also uh, deputy chair for the Smithsonian Latino Working Committee. And um, I think the issue that you're bringing up is very real for me and what I do every day. It takes a lot of effort, resource, resources, monetary resources, in-kind resources to really do what we need to do to make the change. And what I'm getting at is outreach. Like, we need to get out. And in my museum, I've been empowered to do that um, over the last two and a half years, and we've made some strides. But some of my other colleagues have not been empowered the same way. And so I think we need to, as the Smithsonian, continue to lock arms around doing outreach together. We have had made some recent victories in that within the Latino outreach that we're doing um, with uh, the Central Office of Fellowships and Internships, as well as the Smithsonian Latino Center, the Office of Equal Employment Minority Affairs, and now Office of the Human Resources, where we're going to certain conferences together. Because what's happening when I have gone in the past, uh, I get certain reactions about being there. Like, people are shocked that the Smithsonian is here to talk about internships and fellowships with, you know, certain communities, certain institutions. And so, you know, it kind of made it really plain to me that we have a lot of work to do to do outreach. But it just can't come from a few people. We have to do this more together. And, and you know, we're not, you know, I come from an agency like the, uh, the National Park Service where we have units all over the United States. And so if I can't go to, uh, to you know, Puerto Rico, I can call, you know, the park ranges over there at El Morro and San Juan National Historic Site, and I can set something up with them. Well, the Smithsonian didn't have that luxury. So we have to be able to be much more intentional about the outreach and connecting to the communities um, and all these granular communities um, in terms of the African diaspora and other diasporas as well. So I, I think it's happening, uh, but I think engaging the community and uh, external stakeholders like we have here today will have to continue to happen, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested in, in partnering. I had a 
question um, for the panelists, and that is I, I know that often when we're doing work and we're developing projects, you know, there's a conception we bring as cultural workers or as researchers or scholars uh, that to me seems, you know, when we frame our projects or we frame the exhibition, that's where a lot of the, the, the thinking of the, of the scholar comes out. Um, and I wonder, you know, what's the perception of real people on the ground in terms of the African diaspora? I mean, I, I remember when I was doing some of that work uh, for Black Mosaic, one of the assumptions that many people challenged me on is the what? You know, and I'm you know, explaining to them, oh, you're part of the African diaspora. Um, what's, how do you, yeah, what's your, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Actually, the, there's something that, that I, a story that I've told um, quite a few times, and it was um, actually, um, I, early around the time that the Black uh, Mosaic Project was uh, starting, uh, Marie-Thérèse um, Thomas, who was part of the Black Mosaic Project, was teaching a course in multiculturalism. And she was teaching it in Washington, D.C., to a, uh, a group of exclusively black, and I use that, uh, um, um, uh, teachers. In, in um, We were having this discussion, and um, there was a teacher who spoke up, and she said, you know, I had this kid in my class, and I thought he was black, but he was Cuban. <laughs> no, he was Afro. He was he was he was Cuban, and I said, wait, wait, wait. Let's let's go back. Let's let's talk about this. So, you know, what what do you mean by he wasn't black, and and what does that mean? And and I think that her position um, was reflected of reflective of a range of perception that that. Um, you know, there are, there are black people in America, and then there are these other folks. You know? And I think that it's still, unfortunately, um, or, or, or that there are divisions that are, that are um, very um, siloed between communities of African descent, between uh, communities of, that are Spanish-speaking, um, and I think that um, these are still challenges that we have, and I think that one of the best way to deal with some of these challenges um, is through using the convening power of museums, not only the exhibition power, but the power to convene and have these kinds of dialogues about you know what is what is American. What is African American, um, and and how do these things come together? But but I think that it's an ongoing issue uh, that that I don't know in in the work that that um, I've done and of we've done together that that comes up all the time. And I don't think that there's a um, I don't know how much change there has been. Um, over the years, and, and it's something also that Roy Bryce Laporte actually reading rereading the the source book brought up as well um, about the perception both internal and external, whereas we're grouped together. And, and um, one thing that that I wanted to say before, it, you know, the folks who are getting killed because they look, you know, black men who are getting killed because they look a certain, um, black. I mean, people are not saying, well, where are you from? <laughs> and you know, <laughs> when did you come over? And what's your education, and so on? And and there are real issues of survival um, that that I think supersede in some cases the specifics. But but these questions of who we are 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 really very relevant in 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 that way. And these discussions are. So. I, I think these questions come down to. Um, to education, I don't know how much people are being educated. I think that's that's why w there's yeah. a need for the kind of work uh, you know that we're doing. Um, 
you know, because there's there's kind of little awareness of of these overlapping categories. Uh, you know, I remember ta talking to someone about uh, an experience that my son had, who's you know eight years old and um, and is I li as I like to call him Pan Caribbean. <laughs> his, pa his his father is of, of Trinidadian descent, um, and uh, his first name is Esteban, so he's Esteban Alfred, and he was going to be, uh, someone came into his classroom to assess him for uh, learning disabilities and they looked at his first name and they point, picked out the Guatemalan kid in the classroom, you know, because my son didn't necessarily look like an Esteban, um, I guess, to them, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there, these we encounter these issues, this, these kind of issues of, of, of invisibility, um, you know, all, all the time. And I think that there's an increasing awareness of of these issues in part because of scholarship. Uh, so the work of Juan Flores, for example, around uh, the issues of, you know, of, of, of the category of Afro-Latino Afro is really raising, uh, raising these issues and, is, and, and that effort, I think, is very much uh, connected to the grassroots, you know, to, to people who are, who are hybrid, you know, to, to, this, to these young millennials who um, identify in, 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 a variety, in a variety of ways. Just one comment I was going to make, which is that I think, being maybe among the older people in this room, um, I think it's important for scholars to understand that the language that we use, like African diaspora, is very common to us. But there's a lot of embedded in, in the wider population of, let's just call them people of African descent, not to mention people of other descents, that there is a resistance, there's a historical resistance to linking to Africa. Mm -hmm. So when you say Africa, you know, when people 30 years ago started talking about religious practices in black Protestant churches having something to do with the African diaspora, this, there were many ministers and people who were very offended by this thought. So I think we have to keep remembering the it's, it's in the history of scholarship, it's relatively new. It is 30, 40 years old to be talking about the African diaspora. And those of you who've been brought up uh, went to college and there were African diasporic programs in college and you were taught by people who had very wide, um, you know, pan-Atlantic and beyond the pan-Atlantic, like, you know, there are a lot of uh, African Americans who are married to Filipinos. You know, there is a very, very wide, worldwide diaspora of African, people of African descent who are linked in very complex ways, which I think as scholars, we are, we are you know, there's several generations now of scholarship about this, but I don't necessarily, when, when I'm working with various kinds of communities in different regions that have different demographics, the knowledge of, the, of that and that connection and the sense that it is positive, mm. that there is something positive about that connection, I think is still in unfolding in, in communities across the country. And that has a much, you know, that, that has a 400 year history. It's a much longer history than the history that we've been struggling to, to, um, to understand and to articulate. Uh, and that artists have been struggling to understand and articulate and that writers have been struggling and musicians. Now when I read the, the um, novels of young African immigrants, people who are, who either immigrated themselves or their parents immigrated, they talk about these issues uh, of how difficult uh, it has been in various communities for them, that, they, that you know, they're living these complex lives of you know when people say to them, oh Africa, what language is that, or mm -hmm. you know uh, you know what country part of that country are you from? They're in their <coughs> immediacy, they're struggling in a way that I think that those of us who've been working in this area for a long time recognize that there's there are a lot of um, social barriers for ordinary people to just come to this understanding, which is now so fluid for scholars and so so uh, resonant and so so complex. I think with that, we, are, we need to wrap up. I'd like to thank you all for your attendance today and your good questions and your good attention, and, and thanks to Deborah and Diana and Carmen.